For the first part of our roller coaster lab, we had a track that looked something like this. And we placed a ball at the top of the track, which was a certain height h above the bottom. We let go of the ball, and obviously it rolls down the track. And then when it gets to the bottom, it has a certain speed v to the right. And one of the first questions that I asked you about this was, why can we not use kinematics to study the motion of the ball along the track? And what we discussed was that due to the shape of the track, the ball does not have a constant acceleration. The acceleration of the ball changes as it goes down the track. And so for that reason, we cannot use kinematics to study the motion of the ball on the track. But still, we wanted to find we wanted to look for a relationship between the speed of the ball at the end of the track and the height that we released it from. We wanted to find whether or not there was a relationship between V and H. And so we measured H. We could do that pretty simply with just a meter stick or a tape measure. And then we had to calculate V. And the way that we calculated V was to use the projectile motion of the ball after it leaves the track. And so that track was on a table and when the ball gets to the end of the track, there is a subsequent projectile motion of that ball. We were able to use the height of the table, delta y, and the distance that the ball traveled on the ground, delta x, to calculate the speed of that ball at the end of the track. And so we have a bunch of different groups who are, who are releasing the ball from different heights, and we acquired a huge data table of speeds and heights. And by staring at graphs of velocity and height, we were able to find that the velocity of the ball at the end of the track is proportional to the square root of the height at the top of the track. Or similarly, uh, the velocity squared at the end of the track is proportional to the height at the top of the track. So we probably assumed before we did this that the, the higher we let the ball go on the track, the faster it would be going at the end of the track, but we probably did not suspect that it would be the square root of the height at the top that would determine the speed, or at least the proportionality between V and H. But that's what we found in the experiment. And now that we've done this, we were trying to use this relationship to understand the energy of the ball at the top of the track and the energy of the ball at the bottom of the track. And so here, there are two positions. There's the position at the top, which I'm going to label 1. And at position 1, we said that that ball must have some type of energy, and that that energy must be due to its height. And we called that gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy. The first thing we have to understand about gravitational potential energy is that the ball itself does not have gravitational potential energy. That ball, or any object, only has gravitational potential energy because of its location relative to a system. And so when we say um, that the ball has gravitational potential energy, what we really mean is because is it's raised position in this system, it has gravitational potential energy. We know that, the, that it depends on that height h in the form of the equation for gravitational potential energy, which we're going to write with a u and a subscript g, is equal to m times g times h. And so the first thing we see is that as h increases, the gravitational potential energy is going to increase. The second thing that I have to point out is that somewhere in all energy problems, we're going to, going to have to indicate where h equals 0. There has to be a spot where h equals 0, otherwise, um, how am I defining all of these other heights? And so in most problems, it is most convenient to say that h equals 0, which is our free choice, is going to be the lowest position that the object will ever get to. So maybe I've poorly drawn that up above, but here the lowest the ball will ever get to is that flat segment of the track on the right. And so that lowest position while on the track is where I want to call h equals zero. And then I'm going to define all of my heights above that, that point. And so h should be measured from the table up to the ball. 
And so when we're dealing with gravitational potential energy, we need to know the form of the equation, we need to know that h equals zero, and we need to know that the ball itself does not store that gravitational potential energy, but due to its location in, this, in its system, it has gravitational potential energy. And then when the ball gets to a, a point lower in the track, point two, I'll label, we said that the ball has some kind of speed energy and we called that kinetic energy. Now, we'd, we hadn't discussed this, but at some point in between, it would make sense that the ball still has height and so it must still have some gravitational potential energy, but it also has speed. And so it has both forms of energy. It has some gravitational, some kinetic, and so it has less gravitational potential energy than it had at position one, and it does not have as much speed or kinetic energy as what it will have at position two, but it has a little bit of both. But by the time the ball gets to position two, its energy will have been transferred from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy and it will not have any gravitational potential energy anymore. And so at position two, we'll say that the kinetic energy K is equal to one half mv squared. That's the, that's the form of the equation. And so a couple things that I would like to point out about this equation is, yes, as the speed increases, the kinetic energy increases, but the relationship is a squared relationship. So kinetic energy is proportional to v squared. So if the speed of an object doubles, its kinetic energy has increased by a factor of four. Also, like gravitational potential energy, the kinetic energy depends on the mass, but the primary thing that determines the kinetic energy will be the speed. And so uh, we, we now kind of understand what's happening in terms of the energy. We know that this gravitational potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. Energy is changing from one form to another. And if we make a couple assumptions about what's going on between the ball and the track, um, then we can say that all of the gravitational potential energy that the ball had originally has been converted into kinetic energy. And if that happens, then really what we're saying is that the energy is conserved. And the primary tool that we're going to be using moving forward is what is called the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation Of energy. And the law of conservation of energy says just what I've just said, right? The, the energy at the beginning, the initial energy, EI, is equal to the energy at the end, EF. And so here, for us, the initial energy is gravitational potential energy. So sp specifically, I could write UGI, and the final energy is the kinetic energy, which I could write kf. And so substituting the forms of the equations into our conservation of energy equation, we could write mgh is equal to one half mv squared. And if we wanted to, we could solve this for the speed of the ball at the end of the track. And if we did that, we should find that the mass does not matter, it cancels, and that the speed is equal to the square root of 2gh. And this is important because what we found by looking at graphs of velocity versus height was that the velocity was proportional to the square root of the height. And so our law of conservation of energy equation gives us the same thing. Now when we write the equation we find that the actual relationship is that the speed is equal to the square root of 2gh. And so we started without a tool to analyze the motion of the ball along the track, but now we have a tool that's, in my opinion, quite simple to use and easy to understand. If we know the height that we released that ball from, h, then we can find the speed v at any point along that track. Okay? 
Now, if we pick a point that is somewhere in between, then the equation looks a little bit more complicated than what I wrote to the right. But at least for what we did in part one of this lab, we can find the speed v at the end of the track from any height that we release it from by just using the square root of 2gh.